interesting. This is also being recorded, so it'll go up on our YouTube channel and be available to the public, as who, so whoever wants to see it. Great. Okay. Um, well, so what I thought I would do is just sort of talk a little bit about um, what's new in cavernous malformations. I think that's uh, what you're interested in hearing about from me. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the surgery. Um, I uh, have done uh, over a thousand of these. Uh, I've done over 300 in the brainstem and uh, probably close to 100 now spinal cord cavernous malformations. So, um, um, you know, I've been reviewing a lot of my experience uh, for the Journal of Neurosurgery. We we're putting together this collection, what I call the seven cavernomas collection. It started in August and we've been running now. We've got, I think, six articles uh, already in, uh, in print now and uh, a whole bunch more on the way. And you know, one of the things we wanted to do is to develop what we call a taxonomy for surgical approaches, which is a new way of looking at um, how we understand these lesions in the brain and the, particularly the brainstem uh, and the deep areas, and then um, use that taxonomy as a way to help surgeons around the world um, make what we think are the correct surgical choices for, um, for their operations. And um, uh, that's basically um, what we've been spending a lot of our time doing, and I'll, I'll share with you some of that. Um, before I do, though, I wanted to just talk a little bit about this. This is um, a brainstem cavernous malformation grading system that um, I developed with some of my colleagues um, years ago. We just um, um, went through all of our patients. It was about 100 at the time and felt like if we put these variables together, how big it was, whether it crossed the axial midpoint, which means whether it was in the very center of the, the um, brainstem, whether there is a developmental venous anomaly associated with it, then their age and how close they were to the hemorrhage. We would put together these five variables um, with uh, these different points. And um, these uh, points would um, essentially give us a, uh, sorry, let me just shut my pager up. There we go. Um, these, uh, this uh, uh, sum of points would actually give us a grade for the, uh, the lesion, and it would tell us um, uh, what the predicted risk of surgery would be. So the more points you get, the more dangerous or more risky the surgery is. So in other words, if it's bigger, if it's closer to the middle or midpoint of the brainstem, if it had an associated venous anomaly, if the patients were older than 40, or if their hemorrhages were more chronic in nature, these are all points that make an, a, um, a brainstem cavernous malformation more risky to take out. So uh, we put those together. This was um, from that original paper. And what we found was that there are very few up in this high end. So we needed more. So we validated our, um, our grading system in a larger uh, cohort. My uh, subsequent patients, plus I pooled Dr. Spetzler's patients also. And what we found was there's a good distribution of these grades. They kind of break down into what we call low grade, intermediate grade, and high grade. But more importantly, if you look at this graph, what it's telling us is that the higher the grade, the uh, greater the risk. The blue bar is the good outcome. The red bar is the poor outcome. And you can see there's a relationship between higher grade and increased poor outcome. Uh, the second graph over here looks at a very similar thing, except it looks at the relative outcome. They, uh, we, we compared their final outcome with how they were when they came in and looked at the difference. And so um, in purple are the patients that worsened and green are the patients that were either uh, the same or improved. And um, this is just basically saying that, um, um, again, the higher the grade, uh, the, the more the risk. And um, this is uh, something that we were able to validate um, uh, with good accuracy with our statistics. So um, here's the whole uh, argument for the taxonomy. This is a picture of um, the Marin Headlands where I used to live uh, for two decades and uh, spent a lot of time in there. And, and um, when you look across the landscape, you really don't see a way back to San Francisco, which if you look right in that little spot there, that's the Sutro Tower. Um, uh, which is where the city is. And um, the way you find your way through the wilderness, of course, is through um, 
these maps and knowing your trails, knowing where the trails will take you and uh, using them as your, your way back to your destination. Uh, we use it all the time when we drive. This is a Google map from my Tesla. Um, but um, the idea is that we wanted to do a similar sort of thing um, with, uh, with our, our, uh, our surgeries. And so um, let me just jump ahead to the appropriate slide here. And um, we go to here. This is basically a way to think about our lesions. Um, and the idea is if you can um, identify a lesion as a specific type, one of these 16 different types, um, it will then tell you what trail to take or what surgical approach to take. And um, here's a way to look at these um, different, um, uh, these different um, entities pictorially. If, it's, if they're in the midline or in this teal zone, uh, you pick a certain approach and it differs whether you're in the midbrain, the pons or the medulla. Uh, if you're off to the side a little bit in those red zones, you choose different surgical approaches. If you're all the way to the side, or if we look here in the orange zone, uh, more, more or different approaches still. And if you're coming from the back, that image over here on the, um, on the right, uh, if you're in the blue zone coming from the backside, you choose a whole different uh, uh, type of approach. So you can see how the approaches differ depending on where um, in this uh, um, scheme you are. And this is where the, um, these, um, uh, this, taxonomy or this organization of, of lesions really helps. Th this is a slice through the midbrain. And here's a different way of looking at those little color patches. Here's the blue zone right in the middle between the oculomotor nerves right uh, down the middle. And um, as you go to the side, you get into the cerebral peduncle here in red. If you go uh, to the lateral part of the midbrain, you're in the orange zone and that's uh, over here. And in the back, this is the tectal plate in, in purple. Uh, and we see that in the pons uh, here, these are the zones down there. And here in the medulla, similarly, you've got the different zones. And the idea is um, if you can place your lesion in, in the right zone, it'll tell you which of these you're dealing with. And uh, more importantly, that will then take you to your, your decision-making. Now, what's interesting is, um, you know, if you look at these different entities, um, you, you get, um, we looked at the, the patient symptoms and, and what we found was that you could, you could actually break down, um, or you, right at the bedside, you could know exactly which of these different lesions you were dealing with just based on the symptoms. This is an example of a cavernous malformation in the uh, interpeduncular space between the third nerves. And these patients present with um, an old stroke syndrome called the Claude syndrome. It's an ipsilateral third nerve palsy and a contralateral ataxia. So it's, it's um, very uh, uh, consistent with what we learned uh, from our stroke patients. Here's another example. This is a patient with a cavernous malformation in the cerebral peduncle. This patient has a Weber syndrome with an ipsilateral third nerve palsy and a contralateral hemiparesis. So um, you can see that um, our, our old uh, syndromes from neurology and, and strokes uh, help us to understand exactly where these cavernous malformations are. Here's one that's in the lateral midbrain. This is a lumniscal syndrome. And uh, if we keep going uh, in the back, you can see um, here, this is um, in a, a patient with paranoid syndrome with a light near dissociation of their pupils, a, a paresis of their upgaze, and the lesion is back here in the tectum. So, um, we, we can really hone our, um, our acumen um, uh, just based on this new understanding uh, or new way to interpret uh, these uh, bedside findings. Now, um, from a, a surgeon's point of view, which is kind of what I'm all about, um, once we figure out which of these lesions we're dealing with, it tells us the surgical approach. So, you know, if you've got um, here in the midbrain an interpeduncular cavernous malformation, you know you're going to take a transylvian route. If you've got one over here in that orange zone, you're gonna take a supracerebellar route from the side. Or if you've got one in the blue zone, it's gonna be an approach over here. And we can sort of um, work out all the anatomy. They, they differ subtly between um, one lesion to the next. Uh, these are all examples of different 
uh, surgical approaches to different points on that midbrain space. Uh, here's a, an approach directly from the back and here uh, directly from above. If we get, um, uh, I'll skip the video for now. Uh, if we go to the ponds, same story. Depending upon which zone you're in, you choose your, uh, your approach differently. And again, that uh, identification of which um, lesion you have, it'll, it'll take you right to, your, um, to, to the correct approach. And here's an example of an approach we use for lesions that are in the, that are in the front of the ponds. Uh, here's an approach that we use for lesions that are a little bit to the side through a retrosigmoid craniotomy. Here's a different approach uh, for something that's right in the central ponds or on the side. And then here is something that we use for uh, a lesion that's in the back. So um, we, we can keep going. This is a lot of surgeon detail. Um, if you want to see uh, a, a video, I'll show you uh, this one. This is a nice one just to show you. Here's the malformation here. It's in the central part of the ponds. Uh, you can see that um, it's that dark spot here on this image. But uh, for this one, um, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, well, here's the, the grading based upon that grade. It's a grade three, so it's a good surgical candidate. We're going to do an approach that uses um, this kind of an incision and an or what we call an orbitozygomatic craniotomy. So we, we can take off um, a little window of the bone and um, uh, the top of the orbit, and that gets us right down over the eye. And uh, here's what that looks like in surgery. So here's, here's the view of the brain. And as we go in there, our frontal lobe is uh, over in this corner to the bottom right. Temporal lobe is to the upper left. And we're right in the space between the uh, frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. It's called the sylvian fissure. And that's where the arteries run. As we deepen our dissection, we get down to the middle cerebral artery here. We get uh, to the carotid artery. And if we keep going, we can kind of peel back the frontal lobe. There's the optic nerve uh, right over here. This is the carotid artery over here. As we go deeper, we get to the ocular motor nerve. We've talked a little bit about that in this lecture. This is the uh, posterior communicating artery. We follow that back and it takes us into the um, space by the brainstem. So you can see how this, this canyon opens up to us and we, don't, we actually have um, a working space between the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe that gets us even deeper. So here now, uh, there's our third nerve. This is our posterior cerebral artery. Our superior cerebellar artery is down here. And now we're at the very top of the pons. So this little tissue here is just that little thin rim of, of tissue that's overlying the cavernous malformation. And when we go through it, we get right to it. This lesion actually had a very thick calcified portion, which you see here, it's like a, almost like a brain rock. And uh, there it is being kind of moved out of its space with my instruments. And um, this was probably a cavernous malformation that bled. And um, over time, that blood product just sort of solidified into this big calcium piece. There it is coming out. And now just underneath that, we get to tissue that looks more like a cavernous malformation. But um, uh, anyway, this is just to show you the kinds of uh, exposures that we can do very deep spaces, but takes us right down to where we need to, to go to, to access the lesion. So um, the medulla, same story. We have a um, bunch of different approaches down there. And these are some artists uh, pictures just showing the anatomy and, and how we get to these. Here's the beautiful malformation here sitting in, in this case, the gracile tubercle. We can get there through what we call a suboccipital craniotomy, just a little opening uh, in the back there. And uh, here's one on the floor of the fourth ventricle on the medulla side, and we can get there as well. Um, so um, really, we've worked out all the different ways uh, to do that. So um, let me just uh, finish up here. I'm going to jump ahead in my slides. And here, there we go. So uh, just to, to wrap this up, um, you know, we, we've developed this uh, taxonomy, what we call a taxonomy, because it guides our surgical management. We can interpret the signs and symptoms and syndromes so that they really uh, match perfectly the different uh, subtypes or the different names for these lesions. It um, makes us better diagnosticians at the bedside. It more importantly tells us the best surgical approach. 
And when we make those good decisions, um, we get the better outcomes for patients. Uh, it's also a way to, what I think will clarify communication and uh, help us speak the same language when it comes to cavernous malformations, because as it stands now, um, the language and the, the detail uh, needs a little work. So uh, with that, I'm gonna stop. I wanted to keep this a little bit on the brief side so that we can um, open it up for questions. Um, a lot of these, uh, if you're interested in seeing more surgeries, I have what's called the seven series on our Barrow Neuro website. You're welcome to see that. We also have our teaching sessions at Barrow Base Camp also on the website. And the Journal of Neurosurgery is um, publishing uh, a lot of this work that I've been presenting to you. So um, if you're interested, uh, you can see that. Uh, as well. So um, I have questions. Have I have questions. So so my question, I'm going to ignore Q&A for a few minutes because I have a ton. Um, so like in the last five to 10 years, is there technology that you feel has made a huge difference in the way sur surgery is being conducted? Or has there just been sort of a steady progression of, of technological advances in surgery? Yeah, I think um, there have been a pretty steady progression. Um, you know, uh, navigation using um, image images from brain MRIs to guide us in surgery has been very helpful. Um, we have um, better microsurgical instruments. Um, I've developed a whole what I call a cavernous malformation dissection set, which um, helps me to manipulate the tissues and free up that pathology in ways that are better than what I could do before with uh, lesser instruments. So those are new. Um, I've got a whole line of micro scissors that I think are helpful. So, you know, the, these uh, things have really, I think, um, made the difference. The microscopes are uh, ever better. Uh, so yeah, I think we've, we've just gradually pushed the technology so that it's made us better at this. Plus, um, you know, I, I think um, the other thing I would say is um, what we call safe entry zones, our understanding of where we can um, go through spots in the brainstem to access these um, malformations to get them out to safety. That's been a, a real advance in the last decade. And, and so um, coming off of the Q&A, there, um, are there taxonomy scales that you are considering perhaps for spinal lesions or um, for yeah. lesions in other eloquent areas? Yeah, so the seven cavernomas taxonomy will go, uh, will cover the entire brain. Uh, so I started with the brainstem. So we did midbrain, uh, pons, and medulla. We've done thalamus, and we've done basal ganglia. Um, we're working on the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So those will be part of the seven. Those are actually the seven categories that make the name. Um, so we'll, we'll get that covered. For the spinal cord, it's not quite as uh, complicated. And um, you know, for those, it's really just a matter of um, looking at where the lesion comes to the surface, whether it's in the back, the front, or the side. There are a couple of spots where you can go into the spinal cord and do um, safe surgery there, um, but it doesn't really require the kind of um, scheme that we've invented for, um, for uh, the brain. Okay. And do you expect that the taxonomies are gonna be adopted outside of the barrow extensively? Is this, um, I know well, you, I, I understand you've been going around and teaching um, some. We've been hearing yeah. from other surgeons that they've appreciated that. Yeah, well, um, I've learned that when you um, want to get new ideas out into the world, it's like running for politics. You have to um, make sure that your ideas are solid, and then you have to go out there and sell them uh, to people so that they actually use them and, uh, and uh, adopt them. So um, I think I'm in the selling phase. Uh, you know, we are publishing these, and I am lecturing on them and teaching them. And, um, you know, I think um, it's really a matter of whether the neurosurgical community finds them helpful. And meaningful, and if they do, um, then they'll stick, and um, I think we'll be better off for it. I th I think that leads into the question of if people are not able to access the barrow, um, do you feel confident that they can find expertise anywhere, or should they start looking at specific um, university centers, for example, only, or what is it? How do you recommend people make choices about medical care and especially surgical care if they're outside of the barrow? Well, nobody should be outside of the barrow. I know. <laughs> and, uh, I get that. Open. I get we're, that. We're open to everybody. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, we, we have a second opinion program and we're, um, we get a lot of uh, 
uh, destination travelers who, who want to come here for surgery. And But I, I think to answer your question, there, there are a number of um, centers that have uh, pretty extensive experience with um, cavernous malformations. I think the key for patients is to find those centers and get themselves to them because there's no question in my mind that experience matters. You know, um, having done over a thousand of these, um, you just get better the more you do it. And you learn from um, past cases, you learn from um, all the things uh, that others before uh, me at this institution have uh, brought to our, our game. And um, so I think it's important um, that people, you know, seek out centers of excellence. And, you know, um, the Angioma Alliance is really good at identifying those centers of excellence. And um, uh, I think that's one way to know that you're at, at a right, uh, the, one of the right places for these. Yeah, thanks. Um, someone is asking, does dissection to the lesions um, cause damage to surrounding structures as you're going there, um, even through non-eloquent areas? Because I think people saw you cutting and, and things moving and they yeah. went, there was something happening yeah. as a result of that. Yeah, so um, you can cut things that are not brain tissue with no, with no penalty, so to speak. Um, and so all the things that you saw me cutting were what we call arachnoid. Those are the things, um, the little uh, webs, the little connective tissue that go around the brain, but don't actually um, get you inside the brain tissue. The brain is where all the circuitry is and you wanna stay out of the brain. Uh, so when you go in the spaces around the brain, it's fair game and there's no, there's no consequence to that. And that's why it's such beautiful surgery. I think what you saw is that I was in the spaces that were outside, the natural spaces that are outside where the arteries and veins are, not where the brain is. Um, and so you can go there, you can cut that arachnoid tissue and that opens things up. It opens these um, corridors or tunnels that get you to these deep places and um, there's no price to pay. Now, um, when you get to the final spot, um, there may sometimes be just a little thin rim of tissue that's over the malformation and you may need to um, go through that. Uh, and that's where we get into this discussion about safe entry. You know, if it's the safe entry spot or zone, and you uh, go through a little bit of that tissue, the patients won't um, have any deficits um, uh, from that. If, if you have to go through tissue um, that is eloquent or that's outside of the safe entry zones, then you might. So we choose uh, generally to be more conservative in those patients. Does age play a factor? Um, someone is asking, uh, it looked like age was a lower number in the taxonomy. Is there in terms of yeah. aggressiveness of surgery or recovery or? It does. Yeah, yeah. so we, we um, gave two points for patients greater than 40 years of, old, of age. So what that tells us is that um, if you're younger, uh, if you have these uh, lesions and you have surgery when you're in your 20s or 30s, uh, you do better. Uh, it's just that the body is more resilient, the brain uh, is able to heal better, and you uh, get through the rigors of an operation and recovery uh, better than if you're older than 40. And um, it's also a reflection of comorbidities that start to enter the picture when you get to be uh, over 40. So um, for all those reasons, it's, um, it does matter. And um, that's why, you know, in my practice, I'm much more aggressive in patients that present young you know, that have a bleed in their 20s. I'll, not only is the, the benefit greater because um, there's many more years of, um, of freedom from the lesion that's harmful effects, but um, they're also more resilient with the surgical intervention. Um, someone's asking, does previous radiation treatment make the surgery more risky or difficult? Like gamma knife. Yeah, they that's a good question. Um, you know, I'm a real, um, um, uh, opponent of radiation for uh, cavernous malformations. I, I don't recommend that. I don't offer that to patients. Um, so it's not generally part of um, these um, patient stories, but um, some places do offer that and some patients do get it. Um, I have operated on patients that have been radiated before. Um, it doesn't necessarily make the surgery more dangerous, but it can. Um, patients who have had radiation often um, have side effects from the radiation, particularly if it's brainstem radiation. Um, um, so, so yeah, I mean, um, that, that can complicate things if they've had that. Okay. 
some of our patients have had the experience of their cavernous malformations growing back after a surgery. Can you speak to that a little bit? Why does that happen? Is there some way to figure out who's more likely to have that happen? So um, the um, cavernous malformations, if they're not resected 100%, um, can grow back. If you get 99 and leave 1%, and that little remnant or um, that little residual can uh, flare up again and grow back. So you have to be really meticulous and be 100% uh, in your resection. If you have left a little bit, it can grow back. Um, and so um, that's really why that happens. If you do get 100%, then it won't. It, it's uh, generally something that's curative. Now, the only caveat is that some patients have um, uh, the genetic form of cavernous malformations, meaning they have multiple. And so if you take out one and the patients have others, they're gonna have residual disease. It's just, it may not be the one that was operated. It could be another one. Yeah. Okay. Um, someone is asking, based on the, the grading system, is there a motivation to proactively remove a cavernous malformation in the pons prior to a bleed or prior to symptoms? Are there some that just seem so easy to get to that you would yeah. want to get out? Yeah, if there's some that um, are right on the surface or what we call exophytic, meaning it's actually kind of, bulging through the surface and, and you can easily get to it, then uh, those I will entertain um, upfront surgery uh, before a hemorrhage because if you wait and allow the malformation to bleed, uh, there can be permanent deficits as a result. So if you can intervene before that and the risk profile is favorable, then it's worth it. Okay. Um, there's some questions that I know you can't answer. What's the difference between an AVM and a cavernous malformation? That yeah, well, they, they both have the same malformation last name, but they're very different. The AVM is an artery uh, and a vein that connect directly together without capillaries separating them. Um, and those are very high flow, um, um, very um, high pressure um, lesions that can be dangerous because they rupture and bleed. Um, cavernous malformations are really the um, abnormal formation of the capillary beds. They get um, dilated. The cells that are supposed to seal the, the tubes are, are leaky. So th they're not the artery to vein connections with that abnormal hemodynamic, but rather just um, um, kind of weak connections between the cells that make them leaky. So they're very different from a, a hemodynamic or flow perspective. Uh, and they're very different pathologically. So they're really, um, the only thing they share is the same last name, but there no, there's no other similarities between them. Okay, it's meaning a lot of Lees. Um, so so uh, talk to me about DVAs and decision-making about cavernous malformations that are located, sporadic lesions that are, are sort of entwined with a DVA. How do you decide which ones and how to do that? Well, a DVA, um, we often see uh, DVAs with cavernous malformations and our, our dogma are, is to work around them and save them because they do uh, normal things. They drain blood from normal tissue and it's healthy to preserve them. So we work around them and we save them. Um, the reason they're a part of the grading scale is because uh, in my opinion, I, haven't, I don't have a way to prove this, but when you have a big venous system that connects to the malformation, they tend to be a little bit more uh, bloody. And so when they bleed, they probably bleed a little bit more vigorously. And when you operate on them and you get some bleeding in, in surgery, they bleed a little bit more vigorously. So I think for those reasons, that's why uh, we see that in the outcome uh, statistics. But, um, but um, you know, they're really um, not a huge issue from the patient point of view. It's just more of a surgical issue. Okay. So back, this is off the Q&A, back in 2006, Dr. Spetzler said to me that there was, there's always an abnormal vein near a cavernous malformation that, that in his opinion, a DVA was just sort of an exaggerated form of something that's almost always there. Is that something that you observe or is that, was that unique to him? Yeah. Um, well, Dr. Spetzler, um, Put that theory forward, and I think uh, many people have put it to the test. And it's not—it's not true that there's always a, a DVA or a venous malformation. Um, there, there is often a DVA. It's probably the majority of the cases, but it's not always. 
And um, so I don't think we can say it uh, with quite his um, enthusiasm, but that's always how he was. Um, he liked to be very enthusiastic. Um, but, um, but they are seen commonly. And sometimes even when you don't see your classic DVA with the caput medusa or the, the, uh, the trunk with the snakes like the head of medusa, um, you know, you can still see a prominent vein. And um, very oftentimes you see uh, really dramatic examples. So it, it definitely is a part of this disease for sure. Okay, so what I just heard was that it there may not be a DVA, but there is frequently an abnormal vein near. Yeah, it, it's frequent, but not always. But not always, okay, that, I, that sounds good. Um, someone is asking about seizures and seizures um, uh, resolving as a result of surgery or not mm -hmm. resolving as a result of surgery. Is there something that makes that happen versus not? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, a lot of these patients present with seizures as the initial symptom. And so um, we uh, um, operate on a lot of these malformations to try and control intractable seizure. Um, our seizure control rate is really good. It's greater than 80% of patients that get to come off medication and have seizure control without medication. Um, and we published on that. Um, so it, it is an effective treatment for that. Um, I think the things that matter are how bad was the seizure disorder going in? Like many of these patients will present after one or two seizures, and those are the ones that do the best. If patients present after decades of seizures, hundreds or thousands of seizures, then those are ones that may not do as well. And the reason these um, cavernous malformations form or cause seizures in the first place is when they bleed and the blood gets into the brain tissue, that iron um, from the blood gets released. It, the blood cells get broken down, the iron gets deposited, and that's a, that's a stimulant for, uh, for seizures. And so um, that whole process of getting blood in the tissue um, is a, a source of the seizure. And by taking out the malformation and stopping that bleeding, ca uh, that bleeding cycle, then you give the brain a chance to heal and the seizures to go away. Okay. And someone else asked, how long does it take for uh, brain tissue to fill in the space that's once you've removed a cavernous malformation. Yeah, the, people ask the, that all the time, but um, it, the brain doesn't usually fill in. Um, when, when the malformation forms, it displaces the tissue. We go in, we take it out, and what remains is like a little lunar crater, and that crater just sits there. Um, um, so there is some scar tissue that can fill it to some degree, but it's not as though uh, brain tissue just goes in and, and refills that hole or that crater that was there from, uh, from the malformation. Okay. Um, I, missed, I, I had one and then I lost it. Oh, if you have a, a multiple lesions and you have one that has become active, do you think it's more likely that, that others in the surrounding area become activated? And the way the person put it is agitated as yeah. a result yeah. of having that's active. No. No. If you have multiple um, and you have a flare up, it's usually one and you look for the telltale signs like uh, edema or swelling around the one or new hemorrhage within the one. And that often will tell you um, which is the bad actor. But um, it doesn't get the other ones that aren't flaring up. It doesn't get them agitated. Okay. Um, the, someone is, a few people have been asking about the second opinion program and whether, for example, the grading system that you use can be used through the second opinion program or if somebody needs to be there in person and you could- No, we, we can apply that to anybody just based on the films and a little bit of story. I mean, there's some things that like, um, you know, the age of the patient and how recent was the hemorrhage. Those are things that are um, part of the uh, clinical history and not part of the MRI, but the other variables are all part of the MRI. So we, we can uh, get a good handle on things with just a little bit of information. Okay, good, good. And so for those of you who don't know, we have a specific phone number on our website um, that goes directly to the Barrow and it's dedicated to Angioma Alliance patients. So go on our website under the Centers of Excellence, look for the Barrow and you can use their phone number to, to give your information and they'll explain to you what you need to do in order to send your films and stuff like that. Um, I, I would say that um, uh, our website uh, is barrowneuro.org and you can go to there and um, you can access the second opinion 
program through that. And you can also. No, don't do that. Don't do oh. that. So oh. because if they go through your website, they have to pay. And if they come oh, through, okay. they don't. Okay. I, I didn't say anything then. I didn't say that. I didn't say okay. that. Yeah, no, Dr. Zabramski kindly worked that out that okay. our patient. Right. Well, we, we do uh, on our website have some um, other things that might be of interest from an educational standpoint. Yes, yeah, go visit their website for that. Um, so someone is asking about stem cells post-surgery. Is that something you've read about, learned about, have any thoughts about? Um, yeah, stem cell therapy is not... Uh, proven or approved or even in trials for this. Um, there are, there may be one or two trials for stroke patients um, that um, uh, might be recruiting, but that's a completely different indication and not uh, something that we use for this. So have you, this is a question that we asked Dr. Smith last time too, um, multiple generations. Have you ever noticed that they have lesions in the same locations in their brain? He thought um, about it and he no, went. No, I think um, I think uh, you know if it's if if the genetics run through the family, um, there's no uh, there's no um, uh, link to the location. In other words, you can have them anywhere, and if it's if it happens to be in the same place, it's coincidence. Okay. Um, do, does um, hemocidrin ever dissolve or go away? Well, it does. Um, it does. Um, kind of fade, but it doesn't um, all the way go away because um, it, it's pretty, um, it gets sort of into the tissues and likes to linger. Okay. Follow-up question to the filling the brain in with um, after, uh, and I'll, we'll, we're just gonna keep you a little bit longer. Um, how does a, if the brain tissue doesn't fill back in, how does a person get relief from their symptoms post-surgery? Why do people get better after surgery if it's not because the brain fills in? Well, um, what happens is the brain gets irritated or damaged around where the hemorrhage is, but um, has the capacity to, uh, to heal. So sometimes the, um, the deficits that come are because um, neurons are injured, but they, they can heal. Sometimes it's from brain swelling, which affects their function, but that goes uh, with time. So um, there's a part that's a permanent hit, and there's a part that's just a temporary setback. And it's the um, it's temporary setbacks that have a chance to improve and patients can get better uh, as a result of that. That residual deficit that lingers is uh, from the permanent hit. Okay. Someone else wanted to know about, um, can other unrelated traumatic brain injuries that people have affect the surgical score? No, it's not part of the surgical score. No. Um, and traumatic brain injury, um, you know, it's, it's really not um, a, a variable or a factor. If um, a lot of people have traumatic brain injury from old sport injuries or car accidents, and uh, we don't really factor that into our decision-making decision for these. Do you have any recommendations for things that people should avoid doing? Um, you probably don't want them getting traumatic brain injuries uh, if they have CCM. Do you, when you- uh, not, not really. I mean, I tell patients to live their lives and to, um, enjoy life. Uh, you shouldn't, um, you know, live as, um, live in fear or live um, with the sense that um, just because you have a cavernous malformation that you've decided to observe that you can't do the things in life that you enjoy. I think part of that decision is that you're just not going to take the surgical risk, but you're going to take the natural history risk. And um, then um, those patients need to go on and live, live their lives the way they want. Okay. Um I'm, I don't want to keep you too much longer because I'm sure you've got places to go. Just a couple more questions. Um, some folks have had longstanding issues as a result of a cavernous malformation hemorrhage or um, just activity. At, at what point is surgery no longer an option? When is it that, that they should just say, this is something I need to live with? Yeah, well... Um... I think surgery is, is um, an option as long as the lesion is still there and still causing problems. If it's, um, if it's um, bleeding and it's accessible, then um, you know, these are patients that we should um, evaluate for, for surgery. Okay. All right. I think that is, I, there's a bunch of questions, but um, uh, some of them are very similar to the ones I've asked before. 
Um, and I just want to make sure that we respect your time as well. Is there anything that you would like to share while we have you? Well, um, only that, um, you know, when I got to Barrow, um, we weren't officially an Angioma Alliance Center, and uh, that was a, a glaring deficiency that we've uh, corrected. So I'm really pleased to let everybody know that we are a certified card-carrying Angioma Alliance Center and um, uh, happy to help in any way that we can. Oh. We are happy to have you, and we appreciate the service that the Barrow gives to our patients. And the fact that you have the second opinion program has been spectacular for us, honestly. So, and and also the research that you that you forward by being part of the different consortia that that we're also part of. So. Great. Yeah, we um we're um I formed um the Brain Vascular Malformations Consortium with Bill Young and Helen Kim and. Um, you know, CCM is a big part of that. We have three projects in that, and CCM is one of the three. And uh, we've been at that now for 14 years. So, um, you know, it's uh, great to have your help in all of our research activities. Yeah, yeah. Before we close, I need to tell folks the um, there's going to be a, a link to our support group. It just went in the chat. So that's going to happen immediately after this session. You can just click it there and it'll take you either right to the registration or to the support group. Dr. Lawton, you don't have to go really. You don't have to go to the support group. <laughs> it's, it's in the chat. Um, if you see, if you glance through any of the other questions as I'm talking, if there's anything else that you want to be sure that you speak to, we're happy to. Okay. to have you well, I actually have a surgery I've got to go do. So I think I'm going to sign off and. Uh... Uh, it was great being a part of this. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, Good you're night. welcome. Good Bye, night. Everybody. Good night, everyone.